Welcome to Center for Khmer Studies um, uh, and to our webinar today. Uh, Center for Khmer Studies is an institute devoted to teaching and research over all aspects of Cambodian culture and society. Um, today we're going to have a talk on um, which is international relations focused. Um, my name is John Marston. I'm a scholar in residence here at Center for Khmer Studies for six months. Um, when I'm not here, I'm at the Center for Asian African Studies at El Colegio de Mexico in Mexico City. Um, um, so our talk today is by, which I think we're going to find extremely interesting is by, is by Catherine Reed. Catherine Reed is what has been a CKS dissertation uh, fellowship recipient. And she's, she's now a candidate, uh, uh, a doctoral candidate at the University of Delaware. She's a native of Germany. And prior to her doctoral work, she received uh, a master's degree in Geneva, Switzerland, and also worked there at the um, Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance um, for a period of four years. So her talk today is a small state's world and neighborhood, Cambodian foreign policy and relations. So um, welcome, Catherine. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, or good evening if you're tuning in from the United States like me. Um, let me just share my screen. I can... um, all right. Can everybody, I assume you can see my screen. All right. Um, thank you so much, John, for the uh, kind introduction. And um, I also wanted to start off by thanking the Center for Kermai Studies. Um, the Financial support from the Center for Khmer Studies has been really instrumental in terms of my dissertation research, uh, in terms of international relations research. There tends to be a lot of opportunities to conduct um, extensive field research abroad, actually, especially if you're based in um, institutions in the United States. So there's very few opportunities. And um, the Center for Khmer Studies Dissertation Fellowship um, is one of the um, bright spots and has been um, very supportive uh, in terms of my dissertation research. Um, so I'm very excited um, to be speaking to you all today about my dissertation research. Um, so the title of my talk, as John mentioned, is A Small States World and Neighborhood, Cambodian Foreign Policy and Relations. So as you could maybe tell um, by the title of my talk, um, I'm trying to evoke two different ideas about Cambodian foreign policy with this title. Um, so first of all, um, it's the idea that a small state such as Cambodia needs to actually be approached as the protagonist um, in its own foreign relations, rather than as a mere bystander in international relations. Often international relations research, small states, um, especially economically weak states, tend to be um, approached from uh, the perspective of being just a bystander in the international system. So the title of my talk um, and of my dissertation is very much supposed to evoke this idea that um, we should actually be centering small states as the protagonists of their own foreign policies. And then second, um, it also um, is the idea that small states, um, the way that they conduct their foreign policies um, and the types of relationships um, that they cultivate and that matter most to them, um, not only matters for international relations, but is also distinct um, from how larger states conduct their um, foreign policies. Um, so I also wanted to actually point out um, my choice of photo for this talk today. Um, so I took this photo um, in Phnom Penh, as I'm sure all of you can recognize. And the reason that I chose to include this photo um, of the flags of the ASEAN members, um, including Cambodia over there, uh, is because, as we saw um, last year, Cambodia very successfully hosted um, the ASEAN chairmanship uh, in 2022. Um, and it demonstrated that it's very much an integral member 
um, of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Um, and can also play an important role then on um, the regional stage in terms of managing um, regional relations um, as well as managing um, regional peace and stability, right? Um, so smaller states can also play a larger role um, on, in this regional stage. And not just a smaller state, but also a state from mainland Southeast Asia, um, which traditionally um, has had less of a role in the region than the maritime states. And um, as you will also see um, in my talk, I have also deliberately chosen to examine Cambodian foreign policy um, through uh, how it actually manages its relationships with other Southeast Asian states, rather than through how it um, interacts with large powers such as China. The focus tends to be on Cambodia's relationship with China, um, but as I will argue in this talk, um, Actually, we can learn a lot more about how Cambodia conducts its foreign policy and um, how it approaches foreign policy by actually looking at how it approaches its relationships in Southeast Asia. All right, so I wanted to um, get started by just briefly, briefly prefacing that um, uh, the stage I'm at in my dissertation um, research, right? Um, so these are going to be preliminary findings from my dissertation research. Um, and I'm currently in the writing stage um, of my substantive chapters of my case study chapters. Um, so I'm presenting these preliminary findings um, and it's still very much a work in progress. So I very much look forward to any suggestions or comments that um, you all have um, for my research uh, during the Q&A later. Um, so much of my dissertation is actually geared towards developing a theory of how small states conduct their foreign policies. Um, as a preface, I will not be going over um, this theory uh, in this talk um, as I'm focusing more on some of the more um, empirical dimensions of Cambodian foreign policy. But if you have questions um, about how I'm developing this theory, um, please feel free to ask me um, in the Q&A. All right. So, this is just the roadmap um, of my uh, brief talk today. I'm going to start by talking about my research motivations actually and some of the contributions that my dissertation project um, makes. Uh, and I will briefly talk about the research puzzle at the center of my dissertation um, and the research questions that are driving my research um, on my dissertation, but that are also going to continue to occupy me actually, um, as I continue using the rich data that I gathered during my field work, uh, much of which I really actually can't use um, just in my dissertation because I really just gathered um, so much great uh, information on Cambodian foreign policy. Um, I will briefly talk about my main argument. Uh, I will provide some background information in terms of how I collected the data, how I went about that, um, and how I went about analyzing the data. Uh, and then I will um, talk about two different um, aspects of my dissertation. Um, so I'm briefly going to um, go over some findings related to um, how Cambodia then conducts um, this its small state foreign policy. Uh, and give a little bit of a snapshot of how Cambodia manages its relations with Thailand. Uh, my dissertation has two case studies, um, one being Cambodia's relationship with um, Vietnam and the other with Thailand. So I will give a brief um, overview of the one um, with Thailand. And then I will conclude with some takeaways um, before we move on to the Q&A. All right, so... Um, all right, so regarding my um, research motivations, um, I wanted to begin my talk by talking, um, explaining my motivations behind this research because um, throughout my field work um, and even now, I always get the question of why as um, somebody who focused on international relations, am I um, focused on Cambodia? Um, it seems a rather random choice um, for people. Um, so, um, First of all, uh, one of the main motivations is um, actually stems from the experience, my work experience that John mentioned. Um, so I used to work for an international organization in Switzerland. And um, while I was working for this international organization um, in Geneva and also in Cambodia, um, I witnessed kind of this mismatch between some of the assumptions um, that we make about um, 
uh, the politics of our country um, or how our co country interacts with other um, actors um, from afar, um, from the outsider perspective. Um, and then with the practical realities on the ground um, of how politics actually functions and how regional relations um, actually um, carry out in the real world. So while I was working in Cambodia in 2016, I attended uh, a conference by the ICRC on um, banning cluster munitions. Um, there were various Cambodian government officials who attended this, co uh, this conference, including parliamentarians and representatives from the Ministry of Defense. Um, and the conversations that were had um, during this conference were very fascinating to me because a lot of it revolved around the fact that, of course, Thailand had not signed um, the convention to ban cluster munitions, um, that Cambodia could not sign such a convention without um, Thailand also signing this convention, right? Um, and to me, um, it kind of opened up um, this idea that we might be missing a lot of um, regional dynamics in Southeast Asia, actually, um, by focusing not enough on actually what's happening between some of the Southeast Asian states. There's a lot of focus on um, U.S.-China competition um, and China's relationship with some of the individual um, Southeast Asian states, um, but we really aren't focusing very much um, uh, in comparison um, on some of the dynamics that are happening between the regional states and how that might actually impact then um, regional peace and stability. So um, that's kind of the background in terms of how I got interested in this topic, actually. Um, so one of my main um, motivations um, and contributions is that um, my research, through my research, I want to try to improve our knowledge then of international relations um, through incorporating non-Western experiences, particularly in international relations research, um, as some of you may know. Um, a lot of the theories have been developed through um, uh, case studies of um, Western countries. Um, and how they have um, uh, interacted um, with each other. Um, and so I want to um, have a greater incorporation of some of these non-Western experiences, especially mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, even within Southeast Asian studies, right? Um, mainland Southeast Asia is relatively understudied. Um, the Mekong subregion um, is starting to become um, a more um, rich area of research, but um, traditionally the focus has been on the maritime states. Um, and also, um, my research then um, seeks to contribute to understanding of um, actually regional peace and stability in um, East Asia and specifically in Southeast Asia. Um, we have this idea of a relative peace in Southeast Asia um, and we have mainland Southeast Asia that emerged from decades of um, interstate and intrastate conflict um, at the end of the Cold War um, and then had this challenge of normalizing their relationships. So um, by looking at how they have managed or how they are managing their relationships also, we can also gain a greater understanding um, of regional peace um, in Southeast Asia. And then um, most obviously, um, I think um, I'm interested in and my research um, builds on uh, the growing research on Cambodian foreign policy um, and uh, foreign relations. Um, there's rich research by um, Cambodian scholars um, there's, for example, the book by um, the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung on Cambodian foreign policy, um, and I very much want to build um, on this work and also to um, uh, create greater links then to international relations theory. All right, so um, these are some of my uh, motivations and also the contributions that I hope um, that my project then will make. All right, so um, to start off with then, um, I wanted to start with um, uh, just talking a little bit about um, my situating Cambodia as a small state, right? Um, I'm positioning Cambodia as a small state um, in an international system and in um, Southeast Asia. And so um, the fact that Cambodia is a small state, um, as I am arguing then, uh, matters uh, for how it conducts its foreign policy um, and interacts with states in Southeast Asia and also states um, beyond Southeast Asia. Um, so in general, uh, there is um, 
no agreed upon definition of small states. However, there are some at least quantifiable measures um, upon which people generally draw on um, to categorize states that are considered as small in the international system. So here I have um, a smaller version of a table that I made um, that compares Cambodia to some of the other, all of the other states um, in Southeast Asia. The top states are, um, the first few states are mainland Southeast Asia and the last states are um, maritime Southeast Asia. Um, and some of the measures that I've included here then are um, the quantitative measures that are sometimes used to distinguish um, whether a state is small in comparison to other states, right? So when we then um, look at this table, um, and Cambodia here is um, in highlighted in red, um, in the red color, um, we can very much see that Cambodia, um, by most standards, um, is uh, a small state relative to almost all of the other states in Southeast Asia. Um, and Southeast Asia already, to begin with, is a region of smaller states, right? Um, it's not a, a, with the exception of for Indonesia, of course, um, and the Philippines, but it's not um, known for having um, large states such as um, in Northeast Asia. So um, we have Cambodia and um, it's relatively small. Um, and so all of its relationships, actually, the majority of the relationships that it has um, in its world are um, with larger states. Um, so in blue here, I have um, its neighbors of Thailand and Vietnam. Um, and you can see that um, Cambodia, even um, next, uh, even in comparison to its uh, neighbors, it's, it's significantly smaller, right? Um, I think as we all know. Um, and so um, by most measures then Cambodia um, is smaller. And so it's not just that Cambodia is then located between these two larger states, Thailand and Vietnam, and the fact that they have um, this, uh, these um, historical memories of some of their um, uh, relationships in the past, um, but it's also that Thailand and Vietnam, they have significantly larger populations. Um, their land mass is significantly larger, um, and they also um, have militaries that have significantly larger military expenditures, right? Um, and that are at times located um, quite close to the border, um, Cambodia. And when they are, for example, on the Vietnamese side, they are, um, there are a larger number of um, uh, troops um, on the other side um, in comparison to the Cambodian side. So um, we have um, the fact then that Cambodia is um, surrounded by these larger neighbors um, and uh, we also then um, can think about this in the context of Cambodia's um, land and maritime disputes with all three of its neighbors, actually, right? Um, Cambodia has outstanding um, land and border disputes uh, with Thailand, Vietnam, and with um, Lao PDR. And then uh, the fact that Cambodia is between these two larger neighbors um, is quite um, a security predicament then um, for Cambodia. Um, and even though um, Cambodia and Thailand and Vietnam, um, as well as Laos, have made progress and have negotiated um, towards resolving these border disputes, they still remain ongoing. Um, and so I do want to point out that um, that situation in itself is not unique. To Cambodia, right? Um, Southeast Asia in general, um, because of the colonial legacy, um, there are uh, a lot of um, outstanding, um, particularly border disputes between some of the states. Um, there has been a trend towards resolving some of them, especially amongst the maritime states, but um, this is not a unique situation um, to Cambodia. It's something that a lot of the regional states have to contend with um, as they're um, conducting their relations with each other. Um, so overall, we can say that um, Cambodia, then um, its uh, world is defined then by asymmetry, right? Cambodia is in most relationships, always the smaller actor. Um, and so um, this predicament of being small, um, is just an everyday um, kind of um, occurrence for Cambodia. Um, it's not something um, totally extraordinary. 
Um, at the same time, we also have that border security for Cambodia um, is still a top priority, right? Um, the 2022 defense white paper from the Cambodian um, government identifies um, border security as the top priority for the government. So um, we do then still have um, these security concerns um, with its neighbors. Um, so on paper here, um, the reason why I'm showing you this is because on paper then, um, or in this case on the screen for you, um, Cambodia very much looks like um, a typical small state then uh, that's facing the security predicament and that's quite weak in comparison to uh, its neighbors um, and all the other states in the region. So um, I wanted to just briefly uh, summarize this conventional understanding um, of Cambodia's predicament uh, in international relations theory um, to set up uh, my argument as to um, why I think this um, is actually quite misleading when we're looking at Cambodia. So international relations, then the predicament of small states um, is at least pertaining to um, Cambodia here. Um, in the security dimension, Cambodia is facing um, border disputes with its neighbors, right? Um, so it does have um, some concerns, um, security concerns. On the diplomatic front, um, small states such as Cambodia um, are argued to lack capacity on the diplomatic fronts. Um, some even argue that they have almost no capacity to even um, conduct bilateral relationships. Um, and so overall, small states face this predicament of just um, weakness uh, in their foreign policy. And so then in international relations, the general expectation is that small states are going to be relying on external actors. Um, so in the security dimension, there's an expectation that small states are going to rely on an external security guarantor. So a state that will come to your defense um, if your um, territorial integrity or sovereignty is threatened, right? Um, and the dip on the diplomatic front, um, a lot of the literature talks about um, how small states tend to rely a lot on third parties, especially when negotiating with larger states over um, important issues such as, you know, um, negotiations uh, involving uh, border demarcations um, and border disputes. So in general, uh, we then have this um, portrayal of um, small states that are generally assumed to just lack agency uh, in their foreign policy. Uh, and it's very much a one-dimensional view of small states, right? Um, there is literature now that's trying to um, address this um, understanding of small states, but in general, the international relations literature views small states from this um, uh, mainstream lens. So. Um, I actually argue then that this is a very misleading um, portrayal of small state foreign policy um, and specifically of Cambodia's foreign policy, um, especially with regard to um, its foreign policy in Southeast Asia. So when we look at the sec security dimension, for example, um, Cambodia does not actually have an external security guarantor, right? Um, it's a neutral country. Um, one of the, the principles um, from King Norodom Sernuk is um, the principle of neutrality uh, in Cambodia, in principle at least, is um, neutral and it does not have um, actually a security alliance with another state, right? It certainly, um, especially since the Preavihir conflict has um, cultivated create, uh, greater security ties um, with some states and received uh, military assistance, but it does not have um, an external security guarantor that it can definitely rely on um, if there is a larger conflict with one of the neighboring countries. And then on the diplomatic front, um, we then have this portrayal that um, a state like Cambodia should always be relying on um, third parties or external actors. So for example, such as um, the United Nations or ASEAN, um, especially mediate then these disputes with um, its neighbors. And um, when we actually look at how Cambodia conducts its foreign policy, um, this is more of a mixed result um, in terms of the fact that Cambodia does draw on um, the involvement of third parties, 
Um, so for example, during the Pirelli here conflict, um, it drew on the ICC, the, the um, ICJ, the International Court of Justice. It drew on the United Nations um, as well as ASEAN, but it also heavily relied actually on bilateral mechanisms um, with Thailand um, in order to try to de-escalate and to manage um, the conflict over Prairie here. Um, and in the end, actually, um, the, the third party involvement, um, the ICJ and the UN and ASEAN were not the ones that actually contributed to de-escalating um, the Prairie here conflict. And it was actually through some of these um, bilateral mechanisms. So um, we then have um, this uh, puzzle that actually Cambodia is not behaving quite um, like international relations theory would want it to behave um, as a small state. So my research then um, has two overarching um, uh, and interrelated, interrelated um, excuse me, uh, research questions that I am trying to address. Um, so the first is um, broadly, how then does a small state such as Cambodia actually conduct its foreign policy um, in its own world of relations, right? Um, if it's not um, relying on an external security guarantor, um, despite having the security predicament um, with its neighbors, um, what is it relying on um, in its foreign policy? Um, and as part of that, um, I'm very much also interested in understanding who are actually the actors involved um, in um, Cambodia's relations and um, foreign policy. Um, and also understanding if um, Cambodian foreign policy has actually changed at all from um, uh, the post in the, the post-Cold War period. So from 1993 until 2023, right? Um, 1993, of course, um, Cambodia had to start the process of rebuilding and was still um, in a civil war for much of the 1990s. So um, you cannot really compare um, Cambodian foreign policy in the early 1990s to Cambodian foreign policy now. So um, part of it is also understanding um, how perhaps um, small states, um, their foreign policies evolve. And that gets at this idea that um, Valerie Hudson um, suggests that we need to unpack the quote black box of foreign policy making, um, that we actually need to understand um, how foreign policy is conducted and who is involved in foreign policy making, and not just look at, for example, um, the, the head of state. Um, and then my second um, kind of uh, major research question then is, how Cambodia um, as a small state manages asymmetrical relationships um, during these ongoing territorial disputes. So during, um, while having these um, security tensions still present, um, which is a more serious concern for a small state, right, than for larger states. Um, so as part of that, um, I want to know through what specific mechanisms Cambodia has managed um, its relations with Thailand and Vietnam from 1993 um, to 2023. Um, and how these mechanisms have actually helped to manage their relations uh, in a peaceful manner. Um, typically then, when um, there are studies uh, on Cambodian um, relations with Thailand um, or with Vietnam, particularly with Thailand, um, they tend to focus on one particular um, uh, aspect of the relationship or on um, one particular conflict. So. Um, there are a lot of studies, for example, on understanding the causes of the Prairie conflict um, in 2008, from, uh, from 2008 to 2011. Um, but few studies actually um, try to look at the larger picture and try to see um, across time how um, these states have actually managed their relationships um, and how maybe these mechanisms can help to de-escalate um, disputes or um, what their role really is um, when there are um, actual incidents or, you know, uh, episodes of conflict, right? Um, so part of my project is also just um, uh, looking at a little bit of a longer term period and seeing how um, this actually plays out um, as a process. And this um, feeds into the idea that um, Nicole Jen um, uh, proposes in one of her articles where she says, quote, Southeast Asian governments have relied on fostering relations much more than on stirring conflict among each other. Um, so uh, even though we did have um, the Prairie here conflict, 
given the context um, of uh, Indochina and um, the history there um, in the Cold War period, especially, um, normalizing relations between these states and trying to actually effectively managing them um, is quite a formidable feat. Um, and so um, from that perspective, actually, um, they are managing their relationships um, in a way that's helping to contribute to uh, um, regional peace. So um, my argument is that um, we should understand small state foreign policy um, through um, relational management, actually. Um, the way that small states um, conduct their foreign policies is through um, relational management. Um, and so um, I argue then that small states actually rely on relational management on a bilateral level, um, in particular um, bilateral relationships, to conduct their foreign policies um, during an in an environment of as asymmetry. Um, where their um, partners are larger states, um, and uh, while there are security concerns. So in the case of Cambodia, um, during ongoing um, uh, and unresolved um, border disputes um, that require frequent negotiations between the states. Um, and then um, the purpose of this, um, the way that, the reason that this um, matters for small states especially is that um, I argue that they rely on relational management to ensure stability and predictability in future interactions um, with their partners, with their um, the states that they're interacting with, um, and with which they have potential conflicts. Um, and to develop this argument, actually, uh, I draw um, very heavily on um, the international relations literature in Chinese studies. Um, that literature very much um, approaches state interactions um, from the standpoint of um, relationships um, and rather than from um, the state being just um, an isolated unit um, and existing independent of its relationships. Um, and from this perspective, um, states do not then exist independently of their relationships. And their roles and identities are also shaped um, by their different webs of bilateral relationships. And because of that, um, small states especially, they, um, they really want to ensure then um, stability and predictability. While this of course is also um, a long-term goal for large state states, um, they have other means of achieving stability in, um, in their um, uh, relational world, right? Small states have few tools at their disposals disposal and um, I'm arguing that relational management um, then is um, the biggest way that they can um, help to ensure um, stability. So um, I included this example here um, to kind of illustrate actually my arguments. Um, so in um, the recent uh, book publication, uh, Hun Sen's Thought and Vision for Cambodia, um, Lang and Luck actually describe um, kind of this process um, of relational management. So, um, quote, Cambodia has utilized different levels of interaction and various communication channels with its immediate neighbors to resolve their differences and maintain their peaceful relations. To achieve this end, Cambodia has actively conducted frequent exchanges of official visits with its neighbors, forming joint border committees and promoting cooperation between countries' border provinces. Um, so uh, the first set of um, kind of highlights there in, I guess, brown um, shows you the kind of mechanisms then that are being implemented um, for relational management, right? So they're um, interacting on a face-to-face -face level and they're communicating. Um, the highlighted portions in green there um, tell you about the purpose. So they uh, are aimed at resolving differences and also at maintaining peaceful relations. Um, it's very much uh, aimed at maintenance um, between these states. And then this last set of highlights here um, in yellow uh, shows you the, the particular way then um, through which they're actually implement, implementing this. So they're conducting frequent exchanges um, and for, uh, for example, forming joint border committees. So um, for my dissertation, um, I conducted 13 months of field work uh, in Cambodia. Um, I also did two field trips to Thailand, 
and one field trip to Vietnam at the end of um, the summer in 2022, when, when uh, COVID restrictions were finally lifted. <laughs> Very excited. Um, so um, most of my data um, comes from <laughs> several different sources. So I conducted 50 semi-structured interviews um, with elite actors. Um, they were with current and former government officials um, in Cambodia as well as in Thailand. Um, and they were with uh, experts on Cambodian foreign policy as well as on defense policy um, and Thai um, foreign policy. Um, and I also um, conducted archival research uh, at the National Archives um, to see what um, whether some of these mechanisms, um, some of these, um, for example, joint committees, um, where they originated um, during the colonial period, for example. Um, I spent a lot of time at the library, uh, at the Center for Khmer Studies, actually, um, and went through all of um, King Nordom's, uh, King Nordom Sihanouk's um, bulletin, um, because actually there are a lot of news reports in those um, that I helped um, to see the process of how um, Cambodia, Thailand, and Vietnam um, set up some of these mechanisms. Um, I participated uh, in a number of events. I was lucky to be in Cambodia while there, um, the Cambodian um, government was uh, the ASEAN chair, um, lucky and unlucky at the same time because everybody was quite busy. Um, but I was able to attend quite a lot of events on Cambodian foreign policy. Um, during the early months um, of my field work when Cambodia was um, still uh, uh, under a lot of COVID restrictions um, in 2021, um, I focused a lot on online news articles um, to see different um, uh, major events that happened in their relations from 1993 to 2023. Um, and I accessed the um, Far Eastern Economic Review for that, um, as well as the Foreign Broadcast Information Service um, that's accessible through the U.S. government. Uh, I also have collected a lot of government documents related to Cambodian foreign policy, as well as defense policy, um, and I'm using all of these um, in my dissertation. All right, so um, in terms of data analysis, um, my, my research methods, um, just briefly is uh, process tracing um, to uncover the mechanisms of how Cambodia actually manages its foreign relations. Um, and I'm using the case studies that I mentioned um, across a longer period of time. Um, so I can see also when, um, uh, how they're perhaps, um, uh, what types of mechanisms they're using uh, to negotiate with each other um, and to resolve certain disputes. Uh, for this dissertation, um, with the help of the data that I collected, uh, I created a very large database of bilateral meetings, um, not just meetings actually, uh, a database of bilateral meetings as well as major events that occurred um, in the relationships between Cambodia and Thailand and Cambodia and Vietnam. Um, there's uh, hundreds of entries in the database and I'm using that um, for my process tracing them. Um, all right, so um, so with regard to kind of the first major question uh, in my dissertation um, regarding how actually Cambodia then um, conducts its foreign policy and the types of actors also that are involved, um, I wanted to just give a brief, a brief uh, overview of some of uh, my findings. Um, so um, as you can see here, um, I included this map here that I um, I had to, uh, I made, um, and in this map, um, I tried to center Cambodia um, in the middle, right, um, to emphasize that um, we're approaching Cambodian foreign policy then um, from the perspective of the small state. Um, so the starting point should be um, taking the perspective of the small state. Um, which at the most basic level then um, is actually um, putting it at the center of um, a map like this and situating it in its world of relationships. Um, and that then helps to also un us in understanding um, where its priorities lie in its foreign policy, for example, um, as well as some of the local and regional factors that might influence Cambodian foreign policy. 
um, that might, we might miss um, if we're not taking an approach like this. Um, it also reveals that um, Cambodian foreign policy is actually much richer um, than international relations research would um, lead us to believe. Um, and it's not just centered around a single actor. Um, so a lot of uh, recent uh, research has been on Cambodia's ironclad um, relationship with China. Um, and a lot of media attention has also been on um, this particular relationship, um, partly because of the increasing um, tensions and also the tensions in um, the Mekong subregion. Um, however, when we look at um, Cambodia's uh, own world of relations, we see that it's actually been much richer. So um, with regard to Cambodia's actually small state world, uh, I have um, conceptualized it uh, according to these actually Mandela rings here. Um, so um, we can actually apply the idea of the Mandela system, this pre-colonial um, way of uh, international relations in Southeast Asia to Cambodia's world. So um, the, relate, the, the order of the importance of the relationships um, based on um, the interview data that I have um, roughly actually matches this Mandela system um, and these different rings that I move out to talk about. There are a few exceptions, um, but in general, it does match um, this uh, kind of graph that I have over here. So uh, in the first relational circle, um, we have the most intimate relationships um, for Cambodia, the most important and the most intimate relationships. Um, and that would be Vietnam, Thailand, and Laos. I did not uh, include Myanmar in here um, just because few um, in my interviews actually uh, mentioned Myanmar, um, which is why I included it under the um, second um, ring or circle. And so um, in this first relational circle, um, this was very much the priority of the Cambodian government um, at the beginning of um, the 1990s, right? The first step um, it had to take other than um, kind of still dealing with the uh, um, Cambodian civil war in the 1990s was normalizing relations with these countries. That was one of the most important um, tasks, at least um, in the foreign policy front um, during this period. And we also have a second relational circle, um, which um, has been um, called um, by some the cornerstone of Cambodia's foreign policy, um, particularly ASEAN here um, as an institution, um, as well as um, the states in general. So in the second relational circle, um, we have uh, the fact that Cambodia joined ASEAN uh, at the end of the 1990s, right? It became an ASEAN member um, and has now hosted um, the chairmanship three times. Um, Included in the second circle, actually, as you can also see on the map, is um, China, um, or the fact that southern China is um, in close proximity also to um, mainland Southeast Asia. Japan is included um, because, as some of my interviewees um, pointed out, um, Cambodia has a close relationship uh, with Japan. And this year, Japan and um, Cambodia are signing a um, uh, sorry, comprehensive partnership. Um, and I also put um, the United States in this um, by virtue of the fact that it does have mutual defense treaties um, with some of the states that are in this um, second relational circle. So um, during the 2000s, especially, um, Cambodian foreign policy was very much focused on um, this second relational circle and expanding its relations here. Then we also have um, this third relational circle, um, and this um, demonstrates Cambodia's increasingly diverse foreign policy and its diverse efforts at diversification. Um, so, um, especially in the last couple of years, it's been increasingly engaging with these states. So these include South Korea, India, Russia, and Australia much of which fit actually into this geographical um, circle as well. Um, and um, as some of my interviews pointed out, um, they also put the European Union in this last category in terms of Cambodia diversifying its foreign relations, right? So when we then look at um, Cambodia's um, world here, uh, we see that actually um, it's quite rich <laughs> and um, 
the relationships that matter to Cambodia um, are um, some of the regional relations, uh, its neighbors, um, its, neighbor, uh, its relations with the Southeast Asian states. Um, so I argue that we should really, um, to get at least a really holistic understanding of Cambodian foreign policy, we should um, be looking at this um, first relational um, circle here. Um, because it's going to give us the greatest um, kind of idea of how a small state is actually conducting its foreign policy. Um, all right, so um, looking at Cambodian foreign policy, um, what I found um, through my interviews uh, is that Cambodian foreign policy generally, um, the government generally exercises a cautious but flexible foreign policy. Um, so what I mean by that is that Cambodia has a cautious foreign policy um, in the sense of cultivating a constant awareness um, of Cambodia's predicament as a small state, right? Um, and it does lack resources in comparison, especially to its larger neighbors. Um, and it also needs to be cautious because it has, um, it has this um, security also uh, dilemma in terms of um, having ongoing border disputes um, with uh, all three of its neighbors, but especially with Thailand and Vietnam. Um, so this cautious, cautiousness means that um, Cambodia uh, very much focuses on um, cooperating with um, its larger neighbors. Foreign policy is also flexible at the same time, um, especially in terms of responding to particular disputes um, in the relationships uh, with some of um, in Cambodia's world, and also in terms of deploying different strategies in its small uh, small states, um, in terms of implementing its foreign policy. As a small state, it does have limited resources, um, but it can find um, more flexible ways um, to address uh, some of its predicaments um, that larger states might not necessarily implement themselves. Um, so the way um, that Cambodia actually manages its foreign policy also, one of the reasons why it's flexible is that it encompasses actually a larger range of actors. Um, it, it does not encompass just strictly speaking um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Corporation, for example. There are a larger number of actors involved um, that help to manage um, and stabilize relations. Um, so, um, for example, um, it also has, um, sorry, yeah, um, okay. Since I'm, I'm already speaking for quite a bit of time, I'm gonna go a little bit faster. Um, so um, a second dimension or a second finding is um, that Cambodia has actually gradually adjusted its foreign policy um, across time based on lessons that it's learned um, from 1993 up until um, 2023, but especially that it learned during the Prevahir conflict, um, as well as during its 2012 ASEAN chairmanship. Um, so uh, one of the um, things that a lot of my interviews pointed out was actually that um, under His Excellency's Praxok Hans um, uh, tenure as foreign minister um, over the last um, years, uh, he has very much professionalized actually um, the Cambodian um, foreign policy community and has um, created new institutions such as the uh, National Institute of Diplomacy and International Relations um, that trains Cambodian diplomats, for example, um, and there's also now more, more of a role for um, think tanks such as the Asian Vision Institute um, in Cambodian foreign policy making. So um, through my research, um, I then found that actually um, the small state has adjusted its foreign policy um, across time, which is quite a different picture actually from what, um, um, from what, international relations theory um, expects from small states, um, especially since they view them as very much one dimensional. All right, so um, the last, oh, sorry. Yeah, so here's still um, a quote that captures this actually um, from uh, an author that compared some of the different foreign ministries in, uh, in Asia. And he says, quote, small states can be nimble, 
change management comes more easily to them actually than larger states, right? So there are there are advantages, there are some advantages to being with small states um, and being flexible actually, and um, being able to um, take lessons uh, from some of the experiences and make adjustments um, are some of those. All right, so in the last um, couple of minutes, uh, I wanted to just give a brief um, snapshot of Cambodia's relational management with Thailand, right? Um, so this is based on some preliminary things um, of my original case and my interviews. Um, and here on the side, we have a quote from the Thai foreign minister um, in 2011. And he said, quote, let's not make this a case of one drop of honey that could destroy everything. This was during the Priya here conflict, um, and it very much indicates um, the high stakes um, of uh, not just the conflict, but also of um, the tensions that are um, between Cambodia and Thailand uh, in general, and how much effort it really requires to actually manage their relations uh, on a peaceful uh, level. So, in general, um, Cambodia and Thailand had a protracted process of normalization during the 1990s, right? Um, Cambodia, um, the normalization process of diplomatic relations was complicated by the fact that um, there was still an ongoing civil war. Um, and of course, the um, Khmer Rouge um, were on um, the, the border with Thailand um, or even in Thailand, right? Um, so it's very much complicated this process. Uh, and then in the 2000s and the 2010s, we have um, occasional disruptions in bilateral relations. Of course, we have the, the larger um, conflict from 2008 to 2011, but there are also some other um, disruptions, such as the uh, anti-Thai riots um, and some more smaller disruptions um, in the relationship. So we do have some occasional um, disruptions uh, in the relationship. Um, but at the same time, actually, we have a proliferation of different joint platforms and high level exchanges beginning in the 1990s. Um, and they actually have only increased in number um, over the last um, three decades or two decades, actually. All right. So um, some of these um, are in this um, table right here. Um, so these are some of the bilateral mechanisms through which um, Cambodia uh, implements relational management with Thailand. Um, some of them serve um, overlapping purposes, others have distinct purposes. Um, the first uh, three were founded in, um, were established in 1995. Um, the Joint Commission on the Demarcation of the Land Boundary was um, established in 1999. Um, the Joint Cabinet Retreat, for example, was created in 2003, um, at the same time that we had the um, anti thai riots. And then some of these um, last three mechanisms that you see here, um, between uh, the governors and border provinces and meetings on development co cooperation, um, were created in the 2000s. Um, the last one was created in 2013 after the final um, ICJ verdict on Priya Vahir. Um, and so while I don't have time to go over all these mechanisms and exactly how they play out, I wanted to include this graph because it shows you um, uh, this idea of unboxing the state um, and the fact that the way that Cambodia manages relations with Thailand um, as well as with Vietnam um, is occurring at several different levels of government, right? Um, we have, um, for example, the Regional Border Commission, um, which is not at the national level. Um, the General Border Commission is um, based at the national level, but we have, um, for example, uh, cross-border cooperation between um, governors. Um, so we have different mechanisms um, that are being implemented, um, and they're at different levels of government, um, and within um, different institution. And so um, some of the ones created in the last um, couple of, at least in the last decade, also were created at the same time that there were increasing tensions along the border. So for example, um, the Cambodian government um, was constructing um, more infrastructure uh, along the border, uh, which caused tensions with um, 
the Thai counterparts. Um, and so some of these mechanisms actually um, have been created to deal with some of these tensions and to increase communication then um, between um, these two states. Um, all right, so um, they also, um, another uh, quick uh, point is that some of these have also evolved over time. Um, so the Regional Border Commission, um, a lot of what it did in the 1990s, for example, was um, deal with the Khmer Rouge. Um, and today, um, that's not a task that it does anymore, of course. All right, so um, then we can see that there is this um, framework of reinforcing bilateral mechanisms um, between Cambodia um, and Thailand. I mean, it involves very much frequent communication and face-to-face -face interactions um, with Thailand through different platforms. Um, it also involves different rituals um, uh, that reinforce mutual respect between the two sides, and it also reinforces a commitment to the bilateral relationship between the two states, right? That there is um, mutual respect and also equality between the two states. Um, and this helps to ensure predictability uh, in future interactions, despite these ongoing disputes um, that some of which are larger, but there are um, a more, um, there are quite frequent smaller um, disputes that have to be managed um, between the two sides. Mm -hmm. um, these mechanisms um, look different, for example, on the Vietnamese side, um, so they don't all have to look in terms of um, joint committees, um, as the case here. All right, so to conclude, um, here are some um, of um, some main takeaways um, from my research. Um, relational ties, um, the relational ties that bind states matter. It's not just about material capabilities, um, but it's also about the ties um, that bind these states together and how they try to um, bind themselves together through these different um, platforms. Um, and these help to contribute both to the st stability in the small states world in terms of helping it um, have more predictable interactions with these um, larger states, but it helps also helps to contribute to stability in the region as a whole. Um, we can also see that Cambodia as a small state um, very much has a multi-dimensional foreign policy um, that is premised on cautiousness, but also on flexibility um, in its approach. Um, and then lastly, um, we can see that actually the management of relations amongst smaller states, um, especially amongst some of the Southeast Asian states, can actually help us improve our understanding of international relations, um, and particularly international relations in Southeast Asia, um, which um, lately has been very much dominated then by um, kind of this great power lens. Um, but we can learn a great deal from looking at these smaller states then. Um, here's just briefly my bibliography of some of the um, quotes that I had um, included. And yep, that's it. Thank you for bearing with me. And I um, very much look forward to the Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. I think we all found that very interesting. And it, and these are things we're all been aware of, but it was nice to see them framed in a, in a little bit different different way than we are used to. And um, I see, well, um, I think there'll be, people tend to write their question and answer right at the last minute. I see there's one, which I haven't opened yet. Um, maybe to get the ball rolling while other people are, are, are formulating their questions. Well, by the way, I'm not at all an international relations person. And when I was trying to prepare questions for you, I think some of the things I wrote down are a little bit off the wall. And if we, if we keep talking long enough, you'll get my off the wall questions. But here's one that's not so off the wall. And you do talk about ASEAN. And as you said, a lot of foreign international relations work on Cambodia focuses on ASEAN. And so I thought, Maybe I'd ask you to talk more about ASEAN, and um, and you know I've always wondered that the two things about ASEAN is that it seems like by countries like Cambodia and maybe some of the other members of ASEAN are they're sort of wedded to these stronger to these larger states to use your framework, and 
And, you know, there've been times I've wondered if some of the ASEAN accords sort of are sort of freeze them in an unequal relation. And that's one aspect of it, um, which I wondered whether you would comment on. And But the other aspect, as you said, there's no external guarantor of security for for Cambodia and well is ASEAN in any sense that I don't know has it ever been actually played that role in any of the countries but is it in theory an, ex, an external guarantor of security for a country like Cambodia so um all right so um those are good questions so um in terms of um I, I think generally Cambodia's um, relationship with ASEAN is interesting um, and actually, one of the projects I'm working on right now um, with my advisor is actually on Cambodia's um, uh, uh, ASEAN chairmanships, actually all three of its ASEAN chairmanships. Um, so uh, in terms of um, this, uh, the last question you just asked, um, actually, uh, in a lot of my interviews and a lot of the research I've done, um, what I found is that uh, Cambodia very much um, when it joined ASEAN at the end of the 1990s, um, very much believed that joining ASEAN um, was uh, the solution to its um, security predicament. Even though ASEAN is not, um, you know, it does not provide a security umbrella, um, it doesn't uh, provide that kind of guarantee, but the fact that, um, you know, the ASEAN char charter and um, the norms between the ASEAN states do um, kind of, uh, um, should actually prevent them from um, uh, engaging in armed conflict with each other, right? Um, so Cambodia very much, um, uh, from my interviews, um, what people said in the early, in the 2000s, um, ASEAN very much um, formed the cornerstone. Um, and the reason it was the cornerstone was because they believed that because they now um, are uh, in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, um, this would actually help them um, be more secure um, in mainland Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, then um, in during the Prairie Hur conflict, um, the fact that another ASEAN member um, uh, and Cambodia um, engaged actually in um, you know uh, armed force um, and were exchanging um, fire means that this kind of um, perception, maybe a more idealistic perception of ASEAN shattered a little bit um, in the aftermath of Prairie here. Um, that's not to say um, most of the people I talked to said that um, this didn't drastically change um, how Cambodia um, thought about ASEAN, but it definitely um, tempered its expectations in terms of um, the role ASEAN could play in terms of managing its um, disputes with um, its neighbors in mainland Southeast Asia, right? Um, in terms of uh, uh, your, I think the first questions you were asking in terms of um, uh, whether you, you were referring to ASEAN agreements with, for example, China or the larger states, right? You were talking about um, that or? No, well, not really. I was looking thinking about things like free trade agreements that, um, or, well, I remember the one thing where, you know, that uh, with agreement that, mm -hmm. um, say certain categories of professionals like doctors and nurses could could go from one country to another freely and 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 some of these it seemed like might reinforce uh dominance or inequality in, um, among the ASEAN oh, states okay. so yeah yeah okay. okay yeah sorry i mis misunderstood your original question yeah um so um at least there is a, from what I gather in my interviews, there is um, a perception of uh, inequality in Southeast Asia between the maritime and the mainland Southeast Asian states. Um, I'm less sure about how some of these um, agreements um, within ASEAN might perpetuate those inequalities, um, but in terms of um, how uh, states are interacting with each other during some of these ASEAN summits, um, and in terms of how they're negotiating regional issues, such as on the South China Sea or on the Myanmar um, uh, issue in Southeast Asia, 
um, there are very much um, inequalities between and divisions between the maritime and the mainland Southeast Asian states. Um, and it seems like increasingly so there seems to be a divide um, between those two sides. Not sure if I really answered your question. Well, but... yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I, I better open up to other, other, um, other questions. Um, okay, here's the first question. Um, um, may policy with China risk overshadowing? This is by Michelle Bashon. May policy with China risk overshadowing policy relations with other countries in the region? Um, good question. So um, in terms of um, Cambodia's relationship um, with China then, um, of course we've seen over the last um, couple of years that this relationship has cast a little bit of a shadow in terms of um, Cambodian foreign policy uh, in Southeast Asia and in ASEAN, right? Um, but at the same time, I think there are other Southeast Asian states um, that have uh, certain um, strong links with China in the region as well. Um, so I don't think necessarily that um, this necessarily needs to continue impacting um, the other dimensions um, of Cambodian foreign policy, though I do think it's at the forefront um, at some of what they're currently confronting. Um, but again, um, as I mentioned in my um, presentation, even Cambodia's relationship with China, right, um, is actually um, partly related to Cambodia's relations with both Vietnam um, and Thailand. Um, and so we can't, we can also not just see it uh, independently of um, some of the mainland dynamics. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that's a big issue. Um, next question is from our friend Elizabeth Guthrie. How does the symbolic importance of Angkor for Khmer people and Khmer nationalism affect the contemporary relationship between Vietnam and Thailand? I think she might've been Cambodia and Thailand. Yeah, so. mm -hmm. Um, great question. So, of course, uh, some of the research on uh, the Prairie here conflict goes into, into um, this dimension um, quite a bit, right? But um, in general, in terms of Cambodia's relations with uh, Thailand, um, as well as with um, Vietnam, I mean, I can say in terms of Cambodian foreign policy, actually, uh, the Cambodian government recently um, has started committing to um, becoming more of a, a, what they call a cultural bridge, right? Um, and they have been emphasizing some of this, um, you know, uh, uh, legacy um, of the um, Angkor Empire and um, perhaps the contributions also that Cambodia is having been at this crossroads um, historically uh, can make uh, in the region. Um, so it does play, um, a general um, role, I would say, um, in Cambodian foreign policy in terms of um, the role that it's uh, playing in relations with uh, Thailand. I think that varies very much depending on um, the domestic situation also in Thailand, um, as well as in Cambodia, um, and when um, these particular um, narratives are taken up by particular actors um, in um, yeah, in the relationship. Okay, yeah, a ticklish issue. Um, the next question, um, you know, I, I'm sure we're going to keep coming back to China. This is from uh, Sokraksam. I tried to get away. <laughs> do, yeah. do you see the Cambodian foreign policy with China as a mutually beneficial relationship in the long term? Um, mm. That's a Good question. Um, so in terms of it being a mutually uh, beneficial relationship, uh, I'm not um, sure on that front. Um, I mean, right now in terms of um, also Chinese foreign policy, uh, Cambodia also fits into uh, at least previously what China had in the 1990s, this good neighborhood policy of um, forming closer ties with some of the 
um, not just its neighbors, but also some of the Southeast Asian states, right? Um, and uh, a lot of Chinese foreign policy is based on um, kind of these, this idea of um, having um, mutually beneficial relations and also um, coexistence, right? Um, I think in terms of currently, um, in the long term, it's very much dependent, I would also say, on um, the trajectory of uh, the Chinese um, foreign policy itself um, and what's happening currently in the Chinese government, um, where there seem to be some major changes in the Chinese leadership. So um, it seems a little bit uncertain in terms of um, how that will also affect um, the relationship with Cambodia. Okay. Um, our next question is by Jessica Garber, who, who, who gave her webinar last week. So it's nice to hear from her again. I'm interested in your use of the Mandela framework to understand Cambodia's foreign policy practices. Are there examples of this application in other countries or regional contexts? Do you see this as more unique to, um, to Cambodia's foreign policy practice? Hi, Jess. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, uh, and I actually am very happy about this question because even though this is not the largest part of my dissertation, it's actually something that I am very interested in. Um, and so actually there is some research uh, on whether, um, there is some research and there are some scholars, Southeast Asian scholars that suggest actually that um, Southeast Asian states and not just Cambodia um, the way that they conduct their foreign policies is actually um, still in this Mandela um, system style, right? So I actually got this idea from um, their scholarship um, and also Benedict Anderson um, in his uh, books, a book on um, Indonesia. Um, he also talks specifically about um, Indonesia and Indonesian um, foreign policy thinking and security thinking being informed specifically by this um, Mandela um, type uh, thinking. So um, something that uh, I want to do in the future um, with this research also is to have a greater link then also with this, um, this pre-colonial um, system of international relations, because something that I'm really much interested in is seeing actually um, what continuations um, as well as what um, uh, changes there have been from the pre-colonial period to now. And I think um, this Mandela system, it seems to be one of the things that um, still um, is useful for understanding um, foreign policy in the region. But in general, not too many people have applied it. So it's something that appears in some articles, um, but it's not something that's been widely um, adopted yet. Thanks, Jess. Okay, well, no. We're still open for questions. I told you that I had some off the wall <laughs> questions. So, um, and you know, you're gonna say this has nothing to do with what you're doing, <laughs> okay. with John. but I think it it does. I mean, it has to do with security. And um, and remember that I'm I'm based in Mexico when I'm not here. And um, so I was interested in the whole question of criminal enclaves, and um, and. Uh, you know, Maria Ressa, who the Nobel Prize winner and the journalist from the Philippines, you know, she has made statements about that, well, the global South is, is the beta test and, and the afterthought of companies like Facebook. And she's talking about how, um, what's the phrase, um, weaponization of the social media. And she said that the Philippines is like a Petri dish, you know, that that what's happened, you know, what happens in the Philippines sort of been, you know, the Philippines is a rather weak country, then, then, then occurs elsewhere. And I'm thinking about these these latest issues of, which according to some descriptions, uh, sort of started in Cambodia and is now spreading elsewhere. This um, this um, uh, the scam. What yeah, the online scams where people are 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 brought persuaded to come to Cambodia from other countries and then they're involved on online scams and um and this is you know uh, what I've been reading is this is something that now is being discussed within ASEAN when they have the meetings and it's been discussed but with um 
with Cambodians, when Cambodia diplomat relationship with China, this is something being discussed, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's sort of, um, I, it does relate to security and it does. And yet in some ways it's some, it's not just state with state, but it's some sort of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of um, larger criminal network, which, which affects security as well. And I mean, and, and it's, it's some sense in which the smaller state, maybe the more vulnerable state can, can generate patterns which then spread elsewhere. I mean, would that, what, how do you respond to that? Does that have any relation at all to anything you're interested um, in? No, I think um, in terms of the, um, the issue of the online um, scams, I mean, when I was there too, that was um, something that was just developing um, there and um, it was in the news quite frequently, right? Um, and as you mentioned, um, it does pose some issues, I think, in terms of Cambodia's uh, relations also with the Chinese government, right? Um, uh, in terms of- Originally, of originally they seem to be um, Chinese criminal networks, but now, now the news coverage it's no longer seems it's to be all, safe okay. because it's okay. because it's such a um I haven't global region recently. thing yeah yeah okay yeah i mean in terms of um these transnational crimes those do pose um a large challenge obviously for asean um and that might also be something that um asean as a grouping um since they do address um these types of issues um as part of their framework right um, that might be something that they also have to um, bring up um, uh, in terms of uh, also uh, then managing that. Um, but as you mentioned, the, the dimension of the fact that it's not just state actors here, right? There's a lot of different um, actors and some of them are more hard to track. So um, for a small country like Cambodia that has limited resources also, it's obviously more difficult also to um, perhaps uh, try to um, yeah pre prevent uh, to the extent to which that it can actually prevent that actually from happening and also from spreading um, to other regions seems a bit um, challenging, but that definitely... Oh, okay. Just I had to throw something a little <laughs> bit different out there. Um, uh, another question from uh, Sokrak Samian. Could you share with us how long it took for you to conduct your thorough research. Um, okay, so unfortunately, I am someone who is doing their research, had to do their research during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I don't think I'm a very accurate portrayal, perhaps, um, but uh, in my field research did get delayed and it got longer. So um, in terms of the actual um, research um, period, um, I have been working on it for say like three years now um and um but that was also with a year of intensive field work right um and now i'm um writing that so yeah it's a sure. never ending process unfortunately there's so uh, much data <laughs> yes uh another question from uh elizabeth guthrie have you looked at how the problem quote problem of campus crown mm -hmm. that is ethnic uh, mm -hmm areas of Vietnam has affected mm -hmm. Cambodia's international relations in general? Um, that's a good question. And there's a lot of, um, there's at least some um, good research out there uh, on um, the Cambodia Chrome um, themselves in Vietnam, right? Um, and their relation to uh, Cambodia. In terms of um, that affecting um, Cambodia's, uh, or at least um, the international relations in the region, um, I have I actually know less about how that might affect um, the the relations, um, particularly between Cambodia um, and Vietnam. Um, I know more about um, the issue of um, the Vietnamese, um, the ethnic Vietnamese that are in um, Cambodia. Um, but I do know some about um, what people have talked to me about um, the the I'm blanking on the name the Thai the Cambodians that are in. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, the, the Khmer um, yeah. quite a few people have talked about um, the connections um, between uh, the Cambodian side and um, the Khmer Surin um, 
uh, in Thailand and how that also helps to foster cross-border, um, at least links between Thailand and Cambodia um, in some of these border regions. Um, so that, in that context, it was mentioned um, uh, in a more positive context, actually, um, even though those are um, areas that also used to, of course, during the um, Angkor Empire belong um, to Cambodia. But in that context, actually, was framed in terms of um, you know cooperative elements and something that could foster cooperation. Okay, I'll have one more. If we don't get more written questions, I have one more. So slightly maybe off the wall question, although it, it seemed to me um, significant and actually it relates to this, um, the recent thing of um, accusations that India um, was involved with the Sikh Asan in, in Canada. And this was the case in 2020 uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing the name. Is this a Thai activist? Oh, yeah. Uh, one Sadsa Kit was abducted in June, nine, June um, 2020. He was resident in Cambodia. And um, and I, I don't know, these are kinds of things that, well, definitely for those of us interested in human rights is quite shocking. And it's quite shocking that the Cambodian government just didn't seem to feel the need to respond, even though it was apparently foreign actors uh, assassinating someone on Cambodian soil. Um, I, again, you know, in the large picture, you're more interested in, in you know, border disputes and things like that. This, do you have any, any immediate thoughts on a case like that? And do you think it has any, any long, larger implications for Cambodian Thai diplomatic relations? Uh, I would say that, so in the last couple of years, um, Cambodia's relationship with Thailand has improved quite a bit. Um, in general, it's considered that Cambodia and Thailand have um, a more positive relationship um, at the moment, um, especially since um, the last couple of years. Um, and um, I mean, there was an incident with um, the, the Cambodian migrants that were expelled um, a couple of years ago. but. Um, in the context of that, um, I would say that it might also be um, an issue of not wanting to destabilize the bilateral relationship with Thailand, um, especially since um, some of the um, negotiations um, over some of the um, border areas also are, uh, they have been trying to resume them and are resuming some of them. Um, and so um, it's at a point where um, the Cambodian government perhaps also needs to be um, careful uh, in terms of how it navigates its relationship with Thailand. But of course, that's a um, definitely an extreme case um, in terms of um, that occurring. But yeah. 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 Okay. Well, these are all very, very far reaching issues. And so I think we've all enjoyed your talk. Oh, there is another, but I don't have it on where. Uh, 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 where is it? Okay, I. I'm sorry. I there's. Oh, I see it. Oh. Okay, I I don't see it yet, but it's up here. Uh, yeah. Um, it's just going to be easier. Uh, Cambodia okay. is a. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine, for the wonderful presentation. I have two questions. Cambodia is a small state thriving on the international stage. You mentioned its foreign policy is cautious and flexible. Can you can you further explain this statement and what Cambodia should do to maintain a neutral foreign policy with intimate and second relation, especially between the US and USA and China? Okay, and this is from uh, Yali Rossi Teng. Yeah, so. Um, good question. So, um... In terms of uh, having a cautious and flexible foreign policy, um, having a cautious foreign policy um, is something that a small state like Cambodia needs to implement because um, especially in mainland Southeast Asia, there are these um, ongoing uh, border disputes um, and we do have some at least um, historical tensions also between the states, right? Um, so. In terms of how Cambodia approaches its relations with uh, both Thailand and Vietnam, it needs to be um, quite cautious um, in terms of um, 
the decisions it makes. Um, so for example, um, even with um, perhaps uh, some events that happened with, um, you know, the, the Thai human um, rights activists. So um, there are um, a lot of considerations then um, for Cambodia as a small state that it doesn't um, want to um, put itself in a position that would put it at even greater disadvantage, right? Um, in terms of being flexible, as I mentioned, um, because um, Cambodia is small, um, it, it obviously is a disadvantage, right? Um, but at the same time, it's an advantage because um, at the same time, you ha do have fewer people that are involved in um, the decision making and the foreign policy process. Um, and so that does also give them greater flexibility. Um, they can also be flexible in terms of um, implementing different strategies um, to achieve their foreign policy object objectives. So, for example, um, the Cambodian government, um, one of its, uh, one of the ways that it, um, even though the border disputes are still, um, still under negotiations, it, since the 2000s, um, has been uh, on all sides of its border um, with Thailand and Vietnam, uh, building infrastructure. Um, building roads, um, there have been casinos that are built, there have been um, uh, barracks, for example, for army um, units that are being built, um, and that's also a way of claiming that um, space at the border, right? Um, and that's also one way that um, the Cambodian government is being a bit more um, flexible in the sense that they're also deploying um, uh, perhaps strategies that are not typically associated maybe with um, foreign policy. Um, and they're using a lot of different actors then to achieve these um, foreign policy objectives. Um, in terms of Cambodia maintaining a neutral foreign policy, of course, this is something that's currently um, a big debate um, with regard to uh, Cambodian foreign policy to the extent, uh, to what extent Cambodia is um, neutral, right? Um, and of course, a lot of it is related to the um, Reim naval base uh, in Cambodia and um, China's um, funding of the refurbishment of the naval base, right? So um, the Cambodian government is trying to walk um, at least a <laughs> neutral line um, with that respect. And um, I do think, at least with regard to the Reim naval base, um, there are also Cambodia's own security considerations um, for why it wants to um, enhance its naval capabilities, right, in the Gulf of Thailand, um, related to both Thailand and Vietnam, right? So um, in terms of maintaining a neutral foreign policy um, with some of these second relationships, um, the Cambodian government, I think, um, uh, based on also my um, discussions and my interviews, um, seems to be taking it um, uh, very seriously and is, um, you know, seriously considering a lot of the, um, you know, risks associated with certain actions um, with some of these relationships, right? And so I do think that they are doing what um, uh, they should be doing in this case. Okay, well, thank you very much, Catherine. And I think this has been a very interesting discussion. And um, I'm not missing any more questions, am I? <laughs> uh, um, I think, well, it's our time is up. And so um, again, and thanks everybody for attending and um, and stay tuned to CKS. So, okay, we'll see. Thank you, everybody. Okay. <laughs>